to visit the lands of the Bible from the comfort of your home? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Breakforth Journeys podcast, where we take you right to the very places where the stories of the Bible took place. Be encouraged. Be inspired. Fall in love with the Bible all over again. Now, here is your host, Arlen Salty. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode, number 12 of the Breakforth Journeys podcast. Hans, Elsa, and I are so glad you're here. Every week, more and more people around the world are tuning into this podcast to experience a virtual tour of the lands of the Bible and to grow in their love of scriptures. Today's episode takes us to Qumran. Now, Qumran is best known for the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and also for the largest ancient development found where the Essene sect lived. It is a huge development filled with ritual baths, ancient ovens, mikvahs, and so much more. Of course, most people want to head quickly to the Dead Sea just down the road where they can bob like a cork in the salt water. But before we do, let's visit Qumran. Our group is now gathered under a tent in Qumran. Thank goodness, this is the desert and it is a hot day. Before we begin our tour of Qumran, we want to learn a little bit more to better prepare us for the tour of Qumran that's about to take place. Now, Hans's message today may actually bring some surprises to you that you may have to ponder for a bit and maybe even search in the scriptures. We hope you are ready. So let's get started right away. Here is Hans. Dear friends, you see how how many different surroundings you can find in Israel? We are now only a couple of hours of bus and we're in a totally different area, right? For some of you, this might be the first time in your life that you are in a real desert. I really think it's so neat that we have one day in the desert because lots of the Bible speaks about God leading us, sometimes in our life, different periods, leading us into the desert and out of the desert. And I think the desert is something that is really misunderstood what that really means from God's perspective, from a biblical perspective. But just to give you one little hint, one of the Hebrew words for desert or or wilderness is midbar, midbar. And midbar means literally the place of the word. So the place where God speaks. So you are right now, you know, at the place through thousands of years where God speaks. A little north of you, Joshua and all the Israeli people crossed the river Jordan to go into the promised land. On the mountains over there, Moses died. A little bit north from here, Jesus was baptized. You could say it's a biblical area, right? Yeah. (laughs) And now we have come to this place, the Qumran. And to understand the people here, we have to go back to the, the second century before Christ. At that time, the Maccabeans, they succeeded in taking over Israel militarily, right? For the first time since 586 BC, the Jewish people had, in a way, autonomy. Right? They ruled. They had the power, including Jerusalem including, you know, a big part of Israel. We talked about that yesterday when we talked about the village of Nazareth, right? How they resettled Galilee with Jewish people. And this is the same story all over, the same period. And I don't know how it is in Canada, but in Sweden, we have the same experience as they did in the second century before Christ. And that is that power easily corrupts, right? Power easily corrupts. So what happened to the Maccabees that were in full power, leading the country, having autonomy, having Jerusalem, was that they kind of started to make their own rules, appoint their own priests, not according to the Bible, but according to, you know, what was best for them in a political sense. The priesthood became a a political tool. And of course, there was a reaction, right? And people reacted in different ways. But this is really the the setting to understand the different groups that were operating in the times of Jesus. Because they had their origin in the second century before Christ. And one of the groups, the most unknown, the most mysterious, we can say, was the Essenes. And we know very little about them. But one part of that group went down here. 
that we know for sure. And they did this in opposition to the Maccabees, to the thing that they thought had become politically corrupt, including the temple in Jerusalem, and who was to be appointed as high priest and so on. So they came here, they reacted, and they decided to live a life here that was isolated. You see, this is like, a, reminds you of a, of a monastery, right? Mm -hmm. That was not common at all for the Jewish people to live like this. But this was a reaction. And they developed, you could say, a school of thought, a school of theology of their own. But of course, it had lots of connection to the Jewish belief. They were believing Jews, right? So it was one branch of the Jewish people living down here. And archaeologists have found down here uh, pieces of scroll or whole scrolls from the whole Old Testament, every book except for the book of Esther. So they, they really had the Old Testament as their foundation. And they developed a school of thought of their own. And you kind of got the feel of it when we watched the movie. Wasn't it a neat movie? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it talked about them thinking about themselves as the sons of light. And guess what they called the people up in Jerusalem? Right. That doesn't mean Jerusalem as a whole, because actually we know now that in Jerusalem there was a, an Essene an quarter, an Essene part of the city. So, uh, you know, but still, they, they lived there. They were withdrawn. They were living in isolation. Death and life. They had life here and other people were kind of dead. And you heard about them preparing for the war. They had a strong eschatological mindset. Eschatological, speaking about the end times, they believed that the Messiah would come soon and they believed that they were to prepare for the last battle and they actually believed that there were two persons coming as Messiah that's kind of interesting one priestly Messiah and one royal Messiah a, a king the thing that is interesting is that Jesus mentions all other three groups the other three groups that we have around in Jesus' days are mentioned, but not the group of the Essenes. We have the Pharisees. You know about them, right? Yeah. They took the law, law in a serious way. They really wanted to live by the law, the Torah, right? In a strict sense, but they spread out. They did quite the opposite compared to what the people did down here in Qumran, right? They were in almost every village. They were known among the people. Jesus met them and encountered them pretty much everywhere in Galilee, for example, right? That was the Pharisees. And uh, then we have the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, they were very much, you know, this is 200 years after the Maccabees. But the Sadducees, you could say, they, they took on the heritage of the Maccabees. They had the same kind of thinking. They were friends with the world. They had good relationships with the Romans. They earned lots of money when it came to everything that was connected to sacrifices in the temple and all the people coming up for the big feasts. They were the ones running the show. Lots of power, lots of money, lots of position, right? And then we have the Zealots. You have the Zealots and you know, they believed in violence to bring the kingdom of God about. They, they believed in a military uprising. And that was of course also in, in a way similar to the Maccabees. They just took different pieces of the Maccabees thinking, right? And Jesus kind of, you know, he, he reacted in different ways to these groups. It's really interesting to see in the Bible, right? When it comes to the Pharisees, and, and that's not all the Pharisees that we meet. We meet a special group of Pharisees. So we shouldn't judge them all. But to a certain group of the Pharisees, you know Jesus, how he speaks? You can recollect it from the Bible, right? Yes, he's speaking about sincerity, being genuine in your faith. And then he comes to the reaction against the Sadducees. To them, he only says that when they come up and try to trick him, because they only believed in half the Old Testament. They didn't believe in resurrection from the dead. And Jesus just brushes them away. He says, you think wrong because you know nothing about the power of God or the scriptures. And then the zealots. I think they were thinking about making him king. Maybe they were the ones in John 6 wanting him to become king. You know, the miracles with the bread and the fish. They thought, this is a practical guy. This will be a good general, right? He can supply our armies. <laughs> Let's make him king. But, you know, the way of the cross wasn't really there prescription. That was not their prescription, right? So that was Jesus' statement in relationship to them. But the interesting thing in the New Testament is that the Essenes are not mentioned. And some commentators feel that that might, in part, depend on that Jesus and John the Baptist actually, you know, were kind of close to them, you see? 
And one thing that is really interesting, we find in Luke 22, 10, Jesus is telling a couple of the apostles, you know, how to find the room that he has pre-selected for the institution of communion. Right? And how are they to find the room? Well, Luke 22, 10. Jesus said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? What is kind of odd with this description that Jesus gives? When the man wouldn't carry a, jar. a man wouldn't carry a jar of water if he didn't live in a house a household where there were only men. And that is only the scenes did that. See? So that might be a little clue. And there are many other clues, but I can't go into that now. It will take too long time. <laughs> Anyways, so what I would like to address now is that many commentators, you know, lots of them feel that Jesus might have been here in Qumran. Because this was up and about, you know, running when in Jesus' days. But even more commentators, lots more commentators feel, and they have a better argument when they feel that they think many of them, also the biggest, best experts in the world, many of them think that John the Baptist was here. And you know, if you look into what John the Baptist is preaching about, it gets really interesting if you think about what I told you about what the Essenes believed in, right? Listen, we have Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Midbar, this is it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, that is a seen language. Right? It doesn't have to be a scene, but it's very close to the a scene way of thinking. Uh, and then it talks about what he wears. And then we hear what he say in, in verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You, and this is Harper's sweet, brood of wipers? <laughs> Try my best. In Sweden, it, in Swedish, it's Urmingel. Try that. <laughs> okay. I keep on. <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Wrath to come? That is a seen language. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And he keeps on going. And then we have verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the New Testament. And let me tell you, it's not far from a seen language. You recognize that? Judgment, Messiah to come, the kingdom of God is in hand, and you know, this, this uh, thing about repentance and judgment, heaven and hell, right? But, now I, I, can, I, I see you're a little bit surprised, but I will, uh, hear me out. Here's a thought. The right answer is in heaven, but just let me give you a thought, okay? Maybe it was this way. You know, often I think we have an over-spiritual way of thinking about, you know, how God actually spoke, for example, to the prophets, for example, to John the Baptist. Sometimes we think that, and it might have been that way, we'll, we'll ask them in heaven, but just give you a thought. Sometimes we think, you know, they just, he has walked around in the wilderness, and all of a sudden God just gave him everything that he should say, it was like an angel holding up a sign. You know, he just had to read word by word, and, and the angel just dropped him down by the river Jordan and stopped. Now, what I think is that God, also with the prophets, I mean, that is the word of God. It's from God 100%, so don't get me wrong there. But I think God very often with the prophets spoke in a way that he often wants to speak to us through our what we go through in our everyday life. Right? So I think that God, he actually led John the Baptist to this environment here to give him, you know, so to speak, the backdrop for his message. 
Does that make sense? So he got the teaching about Messiah is to come soon, right? The end times are soon here. Light and darkness. God is holy. We need to repent. This is serious. God loves us, but he's also holy, right? I'm not worthy, he says, to untie the sandals of the Messiah, you see? So he, he gets the backdrop here, but then comes God's own addition, when God directly speaks, right? So I think God spoke to John the Baptist through what you are seeing here, because these stones are from the times of John the Baptist and before that, okay? He spoke to him here, but then comes God's addition. And what is God's addition? Well, God's addition is that I just imagine all of a sudden, or maybe through a period of time, God speaks to John the Baptist and he tells him that all this is in a sense true. The Messiah is coming. The end times are, you know, just about to happen, at least the first arrival of the Messiah. And the Messiah is both a priest and a king, but he's, he's in one person, right? And then, you know, I think God really shocked John the Baptist because then God told him, now you take this message about holiness, this message about repentance, this message about the kingdom of heaven, this message about the Messiah coming soon. You take all this and you go down to the river and I will come with my spirit and then you just pour it out to everyone that wants to receive and you include my forgiving love. So this holiness is to be, you know, poured out to soldiers, Roman soldiers came there, to prostitutes, people who felt unworthy, who came there and, and you know, they re received a message that was really, you know, tough in a sense, but it was also about kingdom of God, the Messiah coming, you know, by grace, through God's loving, atoning grace, to love us and forgive us at the same time. And the last thing I want to say is that this might be a way that the Lord wants to speak to us more and more. We should be, you can say, attentive, you know, that God really can speak through your everyday life. What you are experiencing, you think, well, I work at a farm, that's not so spiritual, or, or I work in a store, you know, or I know these people, and the, I know that prayer group, or my small congregation, or whatever it is. I live by the woods, I live in the city, whatever it is. God can take that, and all of a sudden comes God's addition. When he speaks in his very word into your situation and you suddenly find out that he's going to speak to you through what you have experienced maybe the last couple of years. But God's addition comes and makes it, you know, God's own word to you. And when God sends you that way, please do as John the Baptist. Be obedient and do it. Let's pray. So Lord, we thank you so much that you spoke to John the Baptist. Maybe he was even here. Thank you that you used what he experienced in his everyday life. We thank you so much for that. And now we just pray to you, Lord, that you would just make us aware, make us attentive, that you are there in our everyday life. And you might be right now speaking to us through things that we never thought would be something that you could speak through. So Lord, let us just have new eyes when we look on our everyday life. And Lord, we pray for that addition also. We, we just long for you to speak in a direct way to us. And we pray that you would send us, as you sent John the Baptist, and that you would also make us meet people that are desperately in need of holiness, but also love, your love and your mercy. That we pray to you, Father, in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just like Hans prays, Elsa and I also pray that we'll all be attentive to God speaking to us in the ordinary things of life. Yes, God appears in visions and dreams, and of course through reading His Word above all, but God also speaks to us through the stuff of life, both the seemingly mundane and the extraordinary, as well as the mountaintop experiences and the challenging valleys. May we all be prepared to hear God's voice and then look for opportunities beyond that to share His love with a needy world. I want to let you know that we're gathering quite a photo collection of our travels to the lands of the Bible on our website. If you head over to BreakForthJourneys.com, that's BreakForthJourneys.com, you can see several photos of Qumran, as well as a couple of fun photos from Floating in the Dead Sea. If you can't see the photos right away, just type Qumran in the search bar and you'll find it. Qumran is spelled Q-U-M-R-A-N. Q-U-M-R-A-N. 
as always, if you'd ever like to join us on one of our Breakforth Journeys trips to the lands of the Bible, don't forget to email us at info at breakforthjourneys.com. That's info at breakforthjourneys.com. And we'll be sure to let you know about our next spiritual journey of a lifetime. Don't delay if God is calling you. Hans, Elsa, and I look forward to meeting you again in our next episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast as we take you on a virtual tour to the lands of the Bible where the scriptures truly come to life. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss our next inspiring episode as we take you to another place in the lands of the Bible. For more information on this show, including links, beautiful photos of the Holy Land, and to learn more about our upcoming trips, head over to BreakforthJourneys.com.